Yeah. Oops, I gotta mute everybody too. So hang on. Here we go. I'm gonna mute y'all. Okay, Paul, I've got everybody muted. If you want to go ahead and unmute. There, I find myself in the precarious position of having prepared the uh, introduction for Wanda Stubbard in prayer, and now I haven't been able to find her. And so let me invite you to share, first of all, the news about Abigail. Okay, sounds good. So y'all know that uh, we've been making Abigail and uh, Travis and Tessa, the Barnes family, a matter of prayer for the last few months. And on Saturday, I had the greatest blessing in that I received a phone call from Travis and he had Abigail with her with him and she had some good news that she wanted to share they also called Paul um, but just to hear her voice um, it, it's just like talking I'm talking to you right now you could just not ever tell that this young lady had the experience that she did but she wanted to share that she had been released from the Madonna Center she had her last week there and she's been released of physical therapy and occupational therapy, and she has moved on that uh, they're going to be able to take care of her, her uh, needs so far as um, working to help her regain her memory and uh, uh, work with her vision. Um, they'll be able to do that uh, closer to home. So it was just such an amazing thing to get to talk to Abigail. I haven't met her yet in person. I've seen her, but she wasn't awake when I saw her. And, um, but I got to talk to her and it was just such a marvelous blessing. She sounds like such a delightful person. So I'm looking forward to when I get to meet her in person. Well, so. and it was delightful in the conversation that I had with them. Travis noted that that he had checked on on Caring Bridge, and uh, there are now seventy four thousand people sharing their faith and prayers on Caring Bridge for Abigail and the family, and he was so impressed with that because Lamoni is only a community of a thousand people, and Graceland's another thousand, and so to have seventy four thousand uh, on Caring Bridge, even though it's been a few months now, made it an extraordinary thing. It looks like I'm going to need to ask for some help here because. My PowerPoint has disappeared. How do I make my PowerPoint reappear? Um, can you, you can't see it located at the bottom of your screen? No, it's disappeared off the bottom of the screen. I've tried to go to Finder and see if I can find it that way. And uh, go to PowerPoint and bring up PowerPoint. Uh, start with an empty, bring up PowerPoint and say open and see if it doesn't give you a list of files of which one is will be one of them, hopefully. Okay, well, I think maybe we're getting to it. Thank you. But now, <laughs> where is my file? Well, having blundered there, I don't want to delay you further. I happen to know our guest speaker reasonably well this evening. I remember a few years ago attending her wedding. And that's quite a few years ago, actually, because I think I was only about uh, 10 years old at the time. Um, she married my Uncle Ken. And uh, Wanda Thomas has distinguished herself as, as um, an artist. She's a musician with just an incredible demand people that want to have her play the piano for her for them while they are competing for their uh, school solos and so forth. She'd been playing at the old folks' homes, the hospitals, and various places, and church. She also has been a technician with international uh, credentials from Europe and Asia, and she has uh, been a minister for some years, and so we're gaining the benefit of that uh, this evening because she will be sharing, I think, a sermon that she put together earlier, and uh, it has a strong Book of Mormon base. And so I want to want us to be able to welcome Wanda Stubbert back again. Uh, she has presented previously a couple of times, one on Covenant, 
and another on uh, uh, the first one you presented was God's Grace or something of the sort. Anyway, she she's been a good student of the Book of Mormon for many years, having taught it, having uh, uh, designed music to go along with the lessons. And because she is a composer as well, then that's one of the reasons that uh, we like to have her back because she not only entertains us with good ideas, but she commonly puts in some good music as well. I commonly would uh, shift to the prayer at this stage, and I did write one, and I no longer have a PowerPoint in front of me, but if you'll bow with me, we'll have a prayer of uh, invocation. Lord God, Master of the Universe, Creator of all things beautiful, awesome, and for us, it's just incomprehensible to appreciate how awesome your creation is. We look to you this evening to ask your blessing on Wanda Stubbert and all of our participants, for it's a matter of importance for us to learn to get beyond ourselves and recognize the significance of the uh, eternal business that you had called us to address. And as we look to try to expand our perceptions of the eternal and get beyond the, the fundamental grasp that um, me, 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 we want to be able to appreciate more of your phenomenal multidimensional grasp that creates eternity. And since you have invited us to participate in that eternity, and since we are so far from being able to get a good grasp of what we're really looking toward or talking about, we ask for your help and guidance as wise people like Wanda are able to give us some guidance and wisdom, help us to be able to embrace and grasp and, and challenge and be able to grapple with it so that we can internalize it and become people who can help to transform the chaos of our world into a place of peace. We would pray that you would help us in the quest to become more compassionate, in the quest to become more understanding, in the quest to pray more valiantly that the wars might cease, and in the quest to reach out to bless the children well, there are so many children with so much need and to have them exposed to war and violence seems so senseless. And so we would, we would ask for your blessing for them, for them, we would plead. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the beautiful earth that we are able to share in. We've seen these beautiful sunrises and sunsets in the last week with a marvelous cloud patterns each of them unique and special. And we are so hard pressed to appreciate and adequately embrace the awesomeness of your creation. And yet the glimpses that we're able to see in our small spectrum give us an impression of your face. We thank you for that. We thank you for this beautiful evening and the chance to have us gather together face to face in two dimensions. In the name of Jesus, amen. I do want to call your attention, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, Deb has posted on the chat page the uh, link for the Zoomathon next Sunday afternoon. Uh, the DeBarth family has, for many years, over 30 years, been sponsoring uh, school in Haiti. And uh, with the situation in Haiti as deplorable as it is right now, with the gangs having taken over the government, um, it's uh, really tough because there's no national government by which to provide for schools. And so schools have to be private if kids are going to give, uh, get a chance to go. And so we're sponsoring schools to try to help make it so the kids can get an education and then learn to be able to get an employment so they can feed themselves. Because there's a history in Haiti of kids having to eat clay. And having seen clay cakes there coated with a bit of uh, flavoring, uh, I I felt so sad to see the kids were actually 
I would consume that kind of thing instead of food. And so I'm anxious to try to help out. And so any of you who can contribute, we've also, she's also posted the Outreach International contribution line. I attempted to use that, put a contribution on this afternoon myself, and I didn't receive it yet, but I've been assured that it will be active by tomorrow. And so uh, if you'd like to make a contribution, uh, the benefit there is that 100% of the Outreach International contributions go to the people on the ground. None of it is taken by administration. And so if you are inclined to help, we'd appreciate it. Then if you like the good information that comes from the Outreach International people and others who have been contributing, I think we'll be having contributions probably from Deb, from Robert Cook, and um, I put uh, Apostle Arthur Smith on that list also. I, got, I, I suppose I should be putting him first, but but uh, these are the other people you know that are also the long-term contributors. Wanda, as I understand, has been she and her husband have been contributing for 40 years to uh, try to help people through Outreach International. And so it is an organization that many of us have uh, devoted a good deal of our interest and time to. And so with that, let me again welcome Wanda Stubbert to present. She's addressing the issue of the eye syndrome. And uh, I think you'll find it intriguing, engaging, and and of course, we'll afterwards have opportunity for questions and answers. Uh, your turn to claim the, uh, the share pictures, Wanda, and it's all yours. Hey, we got it, Wanda. Yeah. Okay. This subject for today came to my attention many years ago. And I want to tell you that when you see Robert's name, it's going to be Paul that reads because Robert can't see the screen that well on his phone. So he's going to substitute for Robert. And Deb is going to help me out, too, with the scriptures. So this um, subject tonight is a syndrome that seems to be the root of all the evil in the world. I've called it a syndrome, spelled with S-I-N. The symptoms are sometimes manifested by what we say. For example, <clears throat> I don't like being told what to do. Contrast that with the words of Christ from John 4, 34 and 5, 30. My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. Let's look at some of the symptoms. Um, if you think of some that you would like to mention, Unmute yourself and uh, let me know that you want to add something. Feelings of low self-esteem, difficulties in relationships, a tendency to brag, building ourselves up by putting others down, <clears throat> feelings of inferiority, feelings of hopelessness, Difficulties in relinquishing control. Rendering services to get glory for ourselves. Putting on masks to hide our real selves from others. Does anyone have any other thing they could add to that right now? If not, we'll go on to the next subject. How did this syndrome begin? Moses had asked God to tell him about this earth and the inhabitants thereof, and also the heavens. God began by telling him that he created the heaven and the earth by his only begotten. He reminded Moses about Satan, whom Moses had commanded in the name of his only begotten. He said that Satan was the same which was from the beginning. 
The story is in Genesis 3, 2 through 5 from the Holy Scriptures. And he came before me, saying, Behold, I send me. I will be thy son. I will redeem all mankind, that one soul shall not be lost. And surely I will do it. Wherefore, give me that honor. But behold, my beloved son, which was my beloved and chosen from the beginning, said unto me, Father, thy will be done, and the glory be thine forever. Wherefore, because that Satan rebelled against me and sought to destroy the agency of man, which I, the Lord God, had given him, by the power of mine only begotten, I caused that he should be cast down, and he became Satan. Yea, even the devil, the father of all lies, to deceive and to blind men and to lead them captive at his will, even as many as would not hearken to my voice. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4, we find this about Satan. Let no man deceive you by any means, for there shall come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is created, or that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is a God. Isaiah also remarks on Satan, calling him Lucifer, the son of the morning. Isaiah 14, 12 through 14 has this to say about him. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Second. Oh, I have that one already. Sorry about that. Uh, Deb, would you read the next one? From the book of Mosiah 8, 21, 14, 6, we see the very definition of human sin. In his first sermon <clears throat> to the wicked King Noah and his people, Abinadi quotes from Isaiah 53, 5. <clears throat> All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquities of us all. Iniquities is another word for sin. It also starts with an I. I would like to share <clears throat> briefly, if I can get my voice to work. Um, the first time I had to read this in a group at church, um, I had read it many times before, but something about the last line of this, which this whole thing is written in parallelism, which is a, a Hebrew poetic form. And the first line tells us that we have gone astray just as the sheep do, and they do because I saw millions of them in England when I was teaching there for the whole summer and uh, had to watch out for them when I went on to properties where they were eating. <laughs> and we have turned everyone to his own way. And then this last line, when I hit the word iniquities, something came over me that I just couldn't talk for a little while. And I thought about that word. And I thought that sums up every form of sin that there is. So I, I think I was moved by the spirit to understand a little more about how bad this process was for the Lord to have to take on him the whole world's iniquities. And I'll talk about that a little bit more on this, this thing. The first line tells us what we have done. The second one describes how we did it. And the third line 
parallels the second line with one word, iniquities, and it also shows us the results of our iniquities. In these three lines, we have a description of the plan of salvation to redeem mankind, where Jesus was assigned the task of taking upon him the iniquities of all mankind. What an awful burden for him to bear then and to continue to bear even now and until the end of this earth. The condition in this plan of salvation requires us to accept Jesus as our Savior and to turn back to God's way. Wanda, would you do us the favor of, of, of sharing the relationship between iniquity and inequity? Yes. Please. Inequity means that you are required to give, um, to make everyone equal. And inequality means that you all have the same opportunities to, to um, have whatever you work for. I think that's a simple explanation. Thank you. Otherwise, if you have equity, you usually have some kind of a tyrant in charge of the government who takes all the money and then sees that we're happy with nothing. We can see from the scriptures read so far that the sin in the eye syndrome is forgetting who the creator is and who the creatures are. Wanting for ourselves the glory that ought to be given to the creator. Turning everyone to his own way. Now, I'm going to talk about the eye beam and the eye, and I wish you would get a piece of paper to write on, because I'm going to ask you to do a little exercise. The eye beam fortifies or strengthens walls. The eye lets light into the body. The eye in our relationship to God is like putting a beam in the eye. The pupil is the part of the eye that lets in the light. So take your blank sheet of paper, draw an eye, and then put a large eye beam over the pupil. Do you see that it would be very difficult for the light to come in? Luke 41 through 42, I think that's, I forget what that chapter is, talks about removing in the beam in our own eye before we try to remove the moat or speck from someone else's eye. And why beholdest thou the moat which is in thy brother's eye, but perceivest not the beam which is in thine own eye? Again, how canst thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the moat that is in thine eye, when thou thyself beholdest not the beam which is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, cast out first the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to pull out the moat which is in thy brother's eye. It is clear that the eye wall must come down before we can become humble, or in other words, teachable. Paul had this to say about humility in Romans 12.3, 12.16, and 13.1. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Be not wise in your own conceits, let every soul be subject to the higher powers, for there is no power in the church but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. I have a little song that expresses the eye syndrome very well. And you can follow along, and if you know the tune, you can sing it with me. I, 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 I. I want what I want, no matter what God wants to do with 
my life. I want what I want when I want it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so how should we treat the eye syndrome? And again, if you have suggestions, I'd be happy to hear them. The first thing we must do is to repent of our sins and ask God to guide our choices. We need to rearrange our priorities. We need to let God be God and let Christ be Lord. And that's in a hymnal in the HS version, hymnal of the saints. Humble ourselves. That means we need to give up pride, assertiveness, and haughtiness and give God control of our lives. I'm putting myself in here, too, because I need this to adjust our lifestyles to include more healthful foods and activities. And for the body, a well-balanced diet from DNC 86 and physical exercise. For the mind, study, 2 Timothy, Doctrine and Covenants 85:21. For the spirit, prayer, fasting, scriptures, faith, service, listening to God. Get plenty of rest from Psalm 37, 7. Don't worry endlessly about the future. Matthew 6, 32, 39 through 39, Luke 12, 24 through 14. I've heard people say that if you uh, worry all the time about the future, you're no good for nothing on earth. Wait upon the Lord, and he shall renew your strength. That's Isaiah 40, 31. Remain or rest in the Lord. Prescription in Moroni 10, 29, 30, and in the LDS version 19, 12, and 13, goes like this. Come to Christ. Come means move to move forward toward Christ and to make a covenant with him. Be for perfected in him. The verb perfect means to make thoroughly. It can also mean to improve, refine, bring to final form. The adjective can mean satisfying all requirements, lacking in no essential detail, complete, sane, mature, certain, sure, content, satisfied. Deny yourself of ungodliness, and ungodliness is denying God or being disobedient to him. Love God with all your might, mind, and strength. Your might is the power, energy, or intensity of which you are capable. Mind, memory, the part of a person that feels, perceives, thinks, wills, or reasons. Strength is your capacity for exertion or endurance. And if you follow this prescription, the results will be that his grace or blessing is enough for you. By his grace, you may be perfect in Christ. You can in no way deny the power of God. You will be sanctified in Christ by the grace of God through the shedding of the blood of Christ. Sanctified means to be set apart to a sacred purpose. Your sins will be pardoned. You will become holy without spot. Holy is whole or set apart to the service of God. A spot is a stain or a speck or a faint taint on your character or reputation or a fault. And a fault comes from Latin, valere, to deceive or disappoint. My hope is that all of us can practice this treatment and prescription and anything else you can think of from your own experience to cure the eye syndrome so that we can be transformed to enjoy God's promises given in Moroni. Then we can sing a new song, and you may join me on this song this time. I want what God wants, no matter what God wants to do with my life. I want what he wants when he wants it. 
And that is the end of my presentation. Well, it's my regular prerogative to get to ask the first question. I noticed that uh, that you had in the antidotes to the eye syndrome, there are a lot of our personal relationship with God, but I didn't hear a whole lot about our relationship with other people. So I'm oh. wondering about, it seems to me that, that one of the antidotes is to listen to other people compassionately. Yes, indeed. In fact, if you are doing, if you are wanting what God wants, you will want to do that. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the opportunity for you to engage in the question and answer, I'd like for you to go to the, uh, to the, what is that thing called? The little reactions down, down at the bottom of the page and raise your hand and let Deb uh, keep us in line and, and keep us somewhat mm -hmm. organized. But uh, thank you, Wanda, for your presentation. Um, comparatively brief, and that's fine. It gives us more time for questions and answers. Um, uh, for discussions. <laughs> I, suspect, I suspect that all of us have uh, been exposed to this eye syndrome quite a bit. And so uh, what, how to deal with it? Well, Paul, you had some ideas to give me, and I didn't have time to put them in. Why don't you discuss those a little bit? Well, I want to go back to to the uh, iniquity and inequity to me. I I think I have a different interpretation there from what you had. Okay. I I see inequity as being fundamental cause of iniquity. When, mm -hmm. when people are not equitably treated. Yes. And in a world where we have 1% controlling so much of our economic and political power, uh, there's just not a whole lot of equity, although with a comparatively large middle class, we're getting by with it. But it seems to me that, that there is a major factor that uh, people feeling like they're equitably treated are... Uh, are going to recognize that they do have a contribution to make, and it may not be the same as everybody else because that would be equality. Uh, but equity, I think, doesn't necessarily mean equality, except in the sense that each is considered a viable, legitimate, full fledged creation of God and therefore a legitimate person. Worth of persons. Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's the fundamental principle that. I think uh, needs to be emphasized. Yes. I think that is that is the equity that I believe that God is calling us to. Unison. I heard an interesting thing in the sermon a um, couple of weeks ago about, um, well, I told you once about the, the handwriting of God in our DNA which I heard in the sermon, <laughs> and it had uh, a person in the 1800s looking into the DNA, and he found that every so often he would find a certain spot where it said um, four, six, four, five, six, five, which is the signature of God because it's, uh, I can't remember. <laughs> YHWH? Yeah, it's, yeah, whatever those numbers represent. And he said that the more he looked into it, the more he discovered that it occurred at various, at the same intervals every time. So it was written in our DNA in the whole chain multiple times. Well, and so that would justify our claim to be God. <laughs> No, it's, it claims that we are his. <laughs> he he wrote his signature in our creation. <laughs> the process he set up for it. But the other sermon I heard um, was a, suggest, a subject of, of Deuteronomy in the passage called the Shwa. Shwa whatever they, however they say that. And he said that um, the word that was used for 
um, God uh, for one in that passage who remembers the schwa. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. He said the word for that in Hebrew was Adonai, which is a plural form, and it actually means to them unity. And then he went on to describe that God has three parts, as we do, a body, which he didn't have until Christ came. And then, I mean, he had a spiritual body, but he didn't have a physical body. And then he has a mind, and that's the spirit, which came after Christ, Christ left the world again. And then he has the um, physical part. I mean, uh, mind, body, and spirit, the whole three parts are now complete. I thought that was interesting. Well, I find that interesting, but I find it also culturally contrived because uh, in our culture, we tend to celebrate the, th the three as being the most significant number. We teach our children to the, the three blind mice, the, uh, uh, the th you know, the, the, the multiple three is, is, uh, um, a rhythmic trichotomy that shows up repeatedly through our culture. And I see that as uh, probably influencing our, our uh, presentation of the nature of the divine as well. We mm -hmm. eat with a knife, fork and spoon. We, we watch ABC and CBS and uh, we work our way through time that is divided into threes. Um, we are, we are fundamentally uh, a cultural, a, a trichotomy-based culture. Versus any dichotomy, we add the third to make it uh, so it balances better. And so I'm a little concerned that when we take our cultural impositions and, and impose those on our understanding of the divine, that we may be doing ourselves an injustice in terms of our understanding of the divine. Mm -hmm. This was just a thought that I thought was interesting. I'm not sure how I would interpret it. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we had a man that came to church and he played guitar, classical guitar. And he claims that you never should play any kind of music in church unless it's in three, four time. Because that matches the Trinity. Uh -huh. So you get all kinds of interesting ideas when you talk to people, people about things like that. It's, poss it's possible that the trichotomy that's so common in our culture goes the other direction, that because of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, which mm -hmm. are critical to our culture, that three became important. Yeah, three, I think, is a, used to be important in the church, too, and it still is in some parts. We have three in the first presidency, and we used to have a pastor and two counselors. And that was so that you wouldn't end up with a tie if you were trying to make a decision, I think. But most of the people don't follow that pattern anymore. So um, it may be out of necessity that they don't because there aren't enough priesthood members to have that set up. But uh, anyway, it always worked out well in the beginning. The idea that uh, God is fundamentally in the trichotomy and uh, we therefore culturally derive from that, uh, to me is just simply too limiting. It's a little bit like uh, uh, the God that was perceived during the days that the earth was flat. And I think that's when the trichotomy uh, or the, the Trinity was actually developed. And to understand that God is beyond time and beyond dimension, um, beyond space, 
therefore to must be well beyond the multiple dimensions that we recognize do exist then therefore i think uh, the three is a little bit like uh, still celebrating a flat earth you mentioned something about the great i am what was your thought on that oh yes well, thank you uh, the idea of of the I syndrome, um, there's a fascinating counter thought, I think, or at least the great I am uh, is the sanction for being. And for God to identify himself to man as the uh, source of being is to be the great I. And for us then to attempt to to uh, sublimate that or or claim um, well clearly we are participants in it. Yet uh, the honor that we owe to the great I am is an honor that's that's so much greater than than uh, the ones we like to claim for ourselves that tend to undermine and therefore uh, the syndrome is an illness that takes us away from the uh, recognition of the nature of the divine who is the sanction for all beings. Mm -hmm. We yeah. want to put ourselves in his place. Yeah, and, and so... That's the nature of man, anyway. Yeah. It's mankind, womankind, and childkind, I guess. <laughs> I guess the worst stage for that is uh, two, isn't it? For children. <laughs> All they can say is no <laughs> when they're two. Mm -hmm. Well, and me, 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 me. And me, me, me. And a lot of our kids have grown up to be me people too. Well, and so how do we get them beyond that? You have to have good teaching in the home. <laughs> yeah, it's by loving each other and recognizing mm -hmm. that uh, that the value of the other person is comparable to the value of us. Yeah, and that's a hard job when you know, um, you know, people that don't live up to God's promises. Well, it's really yeah. hard. But I, I remember an old quarterly from a long time ago where there was a bully involved in the story. And this was a quarterly for children in the Sunday school class. And um, the person that was being bullied had an experience where he was able to see that child that was bullying him as God saw him. And when he had that experience, what he saw was a little crippled body, all crippled up and in a fetal position. And if we could see through Christ and God's eyes, other people, we would be able to deal with them a lot easier, I think. And that's one of the hardest things to do when they are not being nice to you or whatever. But when I went into the uh, church where I first had a person that didn't want me to play the piano or anything because she thought she owned uh, the music, <laughs> um, I made it a, a practice to never take offense when they made me the music director because she would come up to me and say things that really weren't very nice. <laughs> and so I made a practice to ignore it and uh, agree with her. Maybe, maybe what you said is true. <laughs> and then one day she got sick and I sent homemade whole wheat bread to her and uh, my husband took it because he went over to visit her. And uh, so the next time I saw her was in the choir practice. And uh, 
another person asked me, um, you're so lucky to have curly hair. Well, one of the things she said about me behind my back was that I spent a fortune on my hair and I left my daughter bunny with stringy hair that didn't, you know, wasn't very good. <laughs> and I wore the best clothes and then those kids wore the cheapest clothes. Well, I wore the hand-me-downs from my older sisters-in-law and sisters when they got too big for them. And the kids wore the hand-me-downs from their children because we didn't have any money to buy clothes. Kenny was teaching school. That might explain the reason. <laughs> and so anyway, she overheard that and she said, oh, I thought you had permanence all the time. But anyway, she after the session was over and everybody was clearing up and most of them had left, she said, that was the best bread I ever ate. <laughs> the bread I sent over to her. So after that, I started making a practice to get the, the bread when we had bake sales and so forth. I always kept out some for that person. Mm -hmm. And um, 20 years later, she called me on the phone one day. And uh, we talked for two hours. And at one point, they, uh, one of the ministers said that I was not allowed to take communion again until, she, until I straightened out the problem with this other person. Well, I wasn't the one that was causing the problem, but I went to sleep and I had three of the same dreams the same night. And the first time I was standing a long way away from this person and we were turned around and were running toward each other as hard as we could run and grasp each other by the neck and hugged each other. I had that dream three times. And so I knew the outcome was going to be okay. So 20 years went by and we were raising our families and so forth. And we talked for a long time. Now, she eventually went to a different branch of the restoration. But um, I still know that when I get to where I'm going, if I'm going to the right place and don't fall away somewhere along the way, we're going to run and grab each other. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, you can, time takes care of a lot of things. So I'm not mentioning any names because I don't want to, to uh, diminish her. <laughs> she was taught by her parents that that was her domain, the music. And so she had a hard time accepting anyone other than that to take care of it. Well, you're but, speaking of a, of a lifetime to, to make that transition. Yeah. One would like to hope that we could make that trans transition more readily. But I, having lived most of a lifetime myself, recognize that there are some and perhaps many cases where it mm -hmm. takes lifetime to work our way through the syndromes that we face yep and if you um i mean i don't i had several spiritual dreams like that but um, um i won't bore you with any more of them because i'd like to hear your ideas <laughs> well i would be interested you mentioned the eye syndrome what are the what other syndromes do you see the scriptures uh encouraging us to to heal or avoid well i can't think of any right now i can only think of the one my husband suffered with for so long and that was called the Meniere street disease and they call it a syndrome because they didn't know enough about it but it's a stress disease that causes you to lose your equilibrium and he fought almost every day at noon. He would almost pass out 
or loses equilibrium at work. But he never gave up. And one day he did fall on his desk in the classroom. And uh, when he got home, he told me about it. And I said, you know, you need to tell those children in the class he taught junior high school that you have this condition because they probably thought you had a heart attack. And it happened to him once in the in a camp setting when he was in charge of the camp. He fell on his food when we were eating dinner together, the staff. And uh, of course, it made it difficult for him to drive too. But he never gave up. And I finally helped him get a little better but he didn't like to take vitamins and I knew what would help him. And, and finally he did take some and he got better, but he had an experience at Temple Grove where he was administered to. And the person there that administered to him even told the mosquitoes to go away and they did. And he was healed for a long time. And then he found out he had diabetes, but, um, he was a different person after that. Very different. It makes me wonder the extent to which he was influenced by the childhood experience of falling in the pickle jar. That's what I keep wondering. Yeah, how much of that affected his hearing. Because when he had the syndrome, um, the Meniers, Meniers, it's a French word. Um, he lost the hearing in his right ear. Uh, I mean, in his, which one? His left ear. He lost it in his left ear. And one day we were doing a little gardening, and I don't do much gardening, but I was standing there trying to help him. I said, I don't think I'd make it as a farmer because I my back hurts too much. He said, well, it's hotter than this in Florida. <laughs> I was on his right, on the wrong side of him. <laughs> mm. Oh, we had a few difficulties with communicating. <laughs> well, but, um, let, let me explain since I raised it. Uh, my understanding is that when he was small, probably three eight or four months. Years. He was eight months old. Eight months old. Apparently, he was reaching into the pickle jar. This would be in Wyoming, um, on the homestead, and and he fell in the pickle jar and uh, was there head down for some time. Yeah, it was the wash water. That, was it wash water? Yeah, your grandma had not taken the wash water out yet. Okay, well, <laughs> an interesting shift in the story here. And yeah, he, was, he was upside down and unable to breathe for an extended period. And when they pulled him out of the pickle jar, his brother, Verl, uh, used uh, artificial respiration on him for an extended period, I think maybe 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. and, and he finally came around again. But uh, the likelihood that there was some long-term damage from that kind of uh, uh, experience uh, is, is what we're suggesting may have contributed to later ailments. Yeah. I think it could have. So be careful about how we treat our kids when they're little. I think um, your mom and dad were both out in the yard. And I think she gave her greatest hog call that day. And she could do a good one <laughs> calling for help because I think her, I think his grand, his dad tried to revive him and couldn't. And, uh, so she was yelling at the top of her lungs to get help from Burl. And then he took over. So he was out for quite a while. But miracles happened and he lived a long life. He died at 90, so almost 91. He did have problems with his memory at the last 15 or so years, but. 
So Wanda, you shared the story about uh, the lady there at church that it took 20 years and Paul, you mentioned something about, you know, we, we sometimes let things go too long or whatever. So um, it's, I guess uh, one question you, and you handled it, it sounds like really well, you didn't retaliate with revenge or anything like that, Wanda, but how is something to, um, your thought on uh, how to expedite that or whatever, because, you know, you may want to change something and you may want to make the relationship right, but if that other person doesn't want to do that, then yes. that makes it, you know, the, the I syndrome, you're doing your part, but they're not doing their part. So mm -hmm. um, you just have to uh, find another way. And I found the bread. I made homemade bread about every day, every week, eight loaves a, a week. It was yeah. all 100% whole wheat with honey and milk. And um, so I, I just always made sure that I had a loaf put aside for her so she wouldn't miss it. And uh, that's the way I got around it. But when I decided that she didn't want me to play, I started a nursery in the basement. And uh, then uh, one night, we, my, I asked a friend, Mary Yoder, to help me. <laughs> and so we set up a proper nursery because before it had been the place for all the other people adults to come in and talk to each other <laughs> while the kids were supposed to be having a class. And so we set up a Sunday evening meeting and uh, this church didn't have a lot of members. I mean, it wasn't a an, an humongous number, but we put out a lot of advertising ahead of time that we wanted to explain to them about our new nursery. And she took pictures of the kids with those old eight, whatever they are, eight cameras, you know, the first ones that came out for videos. We set up uh, learning centers all over our little space. <laughs> and we had a crib in there on one side for the little ones and then two and three year olds on the other side. So when we got to church that night, there were 90 people <laughs> that came. And uh, Mary showed her little videos, and I got up and preached, but I wasn't a preacher. <laughs> I told them all about what we were trying to do, and I told them what they could do to help us. And so I did that for a couple of years till finally. Uh, she let me begin to play the organ a little bit. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, Ted Stewart was one of the organists is in, in organists in the auditorium organ. And uh, he watched me play with two feet and this other person played with one on the pedals. And so he says that I was his teacher. <laughs> he was eight years old. <laughs> but I didn't teach him anything. I just played. <laughs> so that was kind of funny. But you know, there's a way around things. You can be diplomatic. <laughs> but I never uh, tried to, to talk back with anything mean to her. I just said, I won't let anyone offend me, including my own family. And they were probably the worst offenders. Because <laughs> they would tell me how I should have directed the choir or whatever. <laughs> my sister was living with me back then. And she was a musician too. Spent, someone has a hand up. Who is it? But he's got their hand Is up. Is it Spencer or Carol? I don't see a hand up. Over here on okay. the right. 
Well, when they aren't in the same box, if somebody wants to say something, unmute and let it go. <laughs> Who wants to talk? Yeah, I'm not seeing anybody. Anybody? It's a, white, it's a big white hand. That's yours. Is that move, mine? Move, <laughs> move your cursor. Oh, well, it changed my cursor. My cursor is a little white arrow. <laughs> it was a hand though, right? Yeah, it was. Yeah. <laughs> I've been impressed with the cultural difference between the Polynesians and the Americans, where the Polynesians are so generous. And oh. when we, we, there's just virtually no way for us to match them in generosity, even though we may come up with a, what we think are a nice bunch of gifts. Nonetheless, <laughs> we will be. Will, will will be overwhelmed by their generosity. The American focus on the eye syndrome, I think, is a far more uh, burdensome one for us than it is for them because they are yeah. much more oriented toward the we. Well, uh, I remember our trip down there. I took a lot of music down for Rena's sister mm -hmm. because she directed our church's choir and she directed the catholic church's choir the seventh day adventist choir wasn't there a presbyterian or something too seventh day adventist her husband was seventh day adventist oh okay she taught them so she taught them the music and so when it came to the last gift i asked them to find me a ukulele that i could buy that was uh, hand carved by the tahitians so there it was on the pillow where they put all the gifts every time. And uh, I tried to pay them for it. And they wouldn't take the money. So I had one piece of music left, and I thought it was too hard for them to do. <laughs> I had to give it up anyway, <laughs> and I bet she used it. Yep. No reason to part of them. Every time we went on a little tour around the island, they would come. We would come back and find gifts on our pillows, and uh, so you can't outgift them. <laughs> you can try your best, but you can't do it. Well, Deb and I have pretty well dominated the uh, the Q and A this evening. Uh, the rest of you should be given a chance here. Perhaps you haven't been in, you haven't been influenced with this disease. Well, I definitely have. <laughs> Unfortunately, I could relate to far too many of the deficiency things <laughs> on the first slide. Mm -hmm. uh, the more I examine it, the more I discover that the nature of the language that we use tends to, to be so focused upon the eye syndrome that, uh, that we have a hard time being as compassionate as the Lord calls us to be. Um, we have difficulty embracing the uh, the nature of of god resident in that other person and when we can learn to love other people to see the divine in them then i think we have a pretty good strategy by which to to reach beyond that eye syndrome right i'd like to read a poem a uh, song i wrote for um Sky, Ar Sky Orca camp when they used to have that something like the brownies for girls and they wanted me to write <clears throat> a poem about the tapestry of God so that there'd be a verse for each day of the camp and um, that's kind of a uh, something like a 
modern painting, how are you going to describe that? And so I just want to read the words to you. God wrote, God wove the colors of the rainbow and stitched them up against the sky of blue. And in that great design, in that tapestry divine, he wove a message that his words are true. God took a ball of gold for sunlight and glued it up above the grass so green. He made the birds and bees, all the flowers and the trees, and pasted them into the glorious scene. God took a slice of silver moonlight and hung it in the darkened sky above. He sprinkled on some stars, Venus, Jupiter, and Mars, the uh, a sampler of the wonder of his love. God wrote a symphony in nature, the songs of birds, the thunder of a shower, the buzzing of the bees and the whisper of a breeze all harmonize the greatness of his power. God painted all the lovely people in shades of red and yellow, black and white. He made each one unique. Some are bold and some are weak, meek, but everyone is precious in his sight. Wow. Nicely done. That's I had to do that. that in a hurry, and uh, I couldn't believe how it turned out. <laughs> and another time, I had to do one on the treasure of the ages. And... Uh, That one I had, I had ended up with waking up at three o'clock in the morning with the tune running through my head. And I grabbed a pencil and wrote it down with numbers on the scale. Oh. And I got up at seven o'clock before everybody else did. And before a half hour passed, I had seven verses. <laughs> and um, it had kind of a chorus that, was the first verse. There's a little bit of God in everyone. There's a little bit of God in everyone. And I want to find the treasure of the ages. I want to find God in me. <laughs> and then it went on to describe uh, how we could get to that point in the seven verses. <laughs> yeah. But it was given to me. So I don't claim anything as far as authorship goes. You've created a lot of beautiful things over your lifetime, Wanda. Yeah, I try. I used to sew a lot and knit a lot and crochet a lot. And <laughs> bake bread a lot. Ooh. Take care of kids a lot. <laughs> With seven brothers and sisters, you get a lot of that when they're younger than you, some of them, half older and half younger. <laughs> oh, go ahead, Carol. I see your hand, Carol. Yes, am I coming through? Yes, you yeah. are. First of all, thank you, Wanda, for sharing your experiences. <laughs> and um, it, it, it's it's really good to hear the, those things. But I wanted to ask you, I had a young man say to me uh, let's see, last week that the world has changed. Do you believe that the ice is getting the younger people? Or are they not noticing? They just seem so busy and making money and getting through the world and getting what they want. Um, are, are, are our young people getting worse? No, I don't think in so. In your experience? Um, the ones I know haven't been. And the ones I hear about a lot are not. They're getting better there's there's been quite a revival going on all over the world lately 
And if you're not watching, uh, if you're watching mainstream medium media, you probably don't hear about them. But um, there was one that lasted in Tennessee for, I think, maybe almost a year. And people from all over the world came to that church. And they just were worshiping constantly, even standing in long lines and worshiping. So I think there's a major revival coming in the whole world. Hmm. <laughs> Quite an affirmation. Joetta, go ahead. Well, it all kind of falls back on us, too, though, I think. And I want to thank you, Wanda, for your beautiful talent and your giftedness and for sharing it with us. One of the things I was thinking about with the eye syndrome was I have an acquaintance. And she's in trouble all the time with everybody. She just simply can't be kind. She can't be gracious. I mean, it's just really difficult. And so I threw my hands up one day when I walked home and said, okay, God, I'm done. I'm not trying to do anything with this again. And guess what he said <laughs> that night in a dream? She needs you. Yes. Wow. That's what really struck me. And then wasn't very long and something happened really tragic in her life. And she did need me. Now that doesn't mean that everything's okay and that this person is still easy to get along with, but the relationship is better and I have to keep on working at it because God loves her too. That's right. <laughs> I'll tell you a little example of my experience in working because we had a typing pool and we had technicians who wrote courses and they didn't have very good grammar. But when they would bring things into the typing pool, they would be put in a um, line according to when they brought it in. And they would be given an estimate when that piece of work would be typed. And sometimes they were teaching a course and found a mistake and they would have to put that one sheet of paper in there and wait for weeks when the class would be over to get things done. So when I became an editor, I talked to the people that I was editing courses for. And I said, if you come in here and you need something right away in your class, you give it to me and I'll make sure you get it right back because I've been a teacher too. And so they did. And then when I would find mistakes or, or something not too clear in their work, I would say to them, you know, I've been reading this and trying to figure out what to do with it. And, uh, I kind of I want you to explain it to me because you may have some students in your class that are as dumb as I am about this stuff. And I said, if you could just show me how this works, I think maybe I could understand it well enough to know what to do. So they would do that. They'd draw pictures for me and explain everything out. And I'd be writing all the time they were doing that rewriting that particular piece of work and when they'd finish i'd say well i think i understand that now would you look this over and see if that would um, maybe make it a little clearer for them and they would do that and they'd say oh yeah yeah go ahead and use that <laughs> but the other people that were editing before me didn't even know grammar themselves. So I said, maybe they'll have a little trouble understanding this, but we were writing courses for the whole world, really. And some of those people that we taught didn't know English very well. So if you put in something that wasn't 
easy for them to look up and get a translation for. They were lost. <laughs> so that's just a little bit of dip diplomacy you can apply and say, oh, I'm so sorry that you feel that way. What can I do to help <laughs> or whatever, you know? Just add a little diplomacy. The Lord is blessing me right now, right now. I feel his presence here right now in my soul. I may not be able to see what the Lord has done for me, but I know he's blessing me right now, right now. Thank you, Wanda. Thank you all for a pleasant evening and uh, the forum can stay open for a while for people to continue discussion, but uh, 